Raf, this is such a joy to do. As we just said, if we were in the same city, we would be enjoying a tequila together. Sadly, we are not, and so we're doing a podcast instead. Second best. But thank you so much for joining me today. Harry, uh, thanks for having me. Second time around. I guess I did something right the first time to get invited the second time. Clearly did something brilliantly right the first time. I want to start for those though that maybe missed the first show, which is a little bit of context, you know, two to three minutes. How did you come to start Go Puff? And what was that founding moment? You know, Harry, it's kind of crazy. It's been almost 10 years, right? We've been at this for a decade, <laughs> which, is, which is a little a little crazy. But GoPuff started by solving our own use case, right? Kira and I were college students who, you know, realized there's a pretty big need in the market, right? Everyone was going to the convenience store, the drug store to pick up everything they needed. And that experience uh, as a student wasn't always very safe and it wasn't always great. And everyone was always busy. That we said, you know, why doesn't anyone stock and deliver all these goods uh, to students kind of across the country? And we could start this in Philadelphia. And, you know, we had a little bit of an unorthodox start. start, As you know, Harry, we didn't raise money for our first three years. Uh, We were kind of profitable from day one. Uh, Used the profits from Philadelphia, right? Back then, GoPuff was a different service, right? You know, today we're 5,000 items. Back then we were 100 to 200 items, snacks, drinks, uh, and we used the profits that we had from that kind of early GoPub 1.0 to expand to five cities until we raised our first round. And then GoPub really started changing, right? Alcohol, ice cream, over-the-counter medication, baby pets, this kitchens business that we have, all these new verticals to now where we are today, you know, uh, over a thousand cities on a global scale, you know, 12,000 uh, employees globally, you know, much, much more drivers, obviously. So there's so many ways I want to take this. Um, you know, when we spoke last time, bluntly, capital was cheap, money was pouring into the space, you know, faster than it was Adam Newman's new company. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, still amazed by that. Uh, but anyway, uh, flowing into the space, and it's a very different landscape today. Capital's dried up across the board, but especially in this space. Um, we've seen businesses go bust in the space, uh, many. Um, I wanted to watch you start with a little bit of why. Why do you think that capital has dried up specifically for this space? And what are the core drivers? You know, I think, uh, Harry, capital markets have not been friendly for any growth companies over the last, uh, I would say, two to three quarters. But if we're talking about instant needs specifically. You know, we say this all the time, uh, Ikir and I, when you're starting a business as complicated as our business, right, where you have so much technological needs, supply chain needs, logistical needs, where you really need to nail it before you scale it, you have to really focus on the inner crux of your business, the infrastructure of your business before really expanding in a very big way. And that's what we did for our first couple of years. We spent a lot of time building the technology inside of the four walls of the building, building operational excellence, and then really scaling the business by you know proving that we can deliver really strong unit economics. Pretty much everyone else in the instant need space from across the globe had the opposite strategy. You know, all we need to do is open up a whole host of buildings. We'll figure out the tech later. We'll figure out the operational excellence later. We don't have a supply chain set up. It's fine. We'll figure it out later. So it was scale it, then nail it strategy. And, you know, when the capital market started getting more constricted, they realized their underlying business this isn't all that strong, right? They're not producing really strong unit economics. And as a byproduct, a lot of people started really struggling. And I think really it's just the beginning, right? I think it's going to continue. Uh, that trend is going to continue to accelerate because the initial strategy was grow at all cost, not really nail our business, really nail our unit economics and then scale the business. So my take was, you know, obviously I invested in airlift. Um, my take was bluntly that as the cost of capital went up, uh, capital intense, low margin uh, businesses became more and more of a challenge for investors to finance. Would you agree with that summarization, or would you say that's not not fair to categorize our our space as capital intense and low margin? If this business is done right, it's actually not a low margin business. Right. So if you if you set up your your structure correctly and you're buying correctly and your ads business is working correctly, right? And now we're launching a whole new host of businesses that you know I think are gonna improve our margin structure more. 
our gross margin structure is actually among the best in, you know, if you categorize like our retail peers instead of our tech peers, right? It's among the best, right? We have gross margin in the high 30s, low 40s, depending on the region that you're in. And it's actually really, really healthy margins to operate a, a, a profitable business, especially on a unit level. Um, what I'll say, though, is a lot of people, you know, I don't want to I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but a lot of people when they were expanding to city to city, they, they just weren't focused on, you know, how do we build really, really strong margin profile in the business, right? It's no question, right? Infrastructure is expensive, right? You have to, you have to build buildings, it's a set up racks, you need equipment, the whole nine yards. But the return on capital on this business and how fast these markets pay back is really, really incredible once you start humming correctly, right? In the beginning, right, it took maybe a year, a year and a half for a building to recoup uh, its investment. And now it's some buildings you open up and three months later, you recouped all, all your fi fixed costs, right? The, the business really starts humming in a much better way. So it really just boils down to, did you set the right amount of time, energy, and focus on nailing the fiscal responsibility portion of this business being really strong on the fiscal side and then scale the business. Or you said, Hey, I want to grow at all costs. I want to expand as many cities as I can. And we'll figure out our distributors later. We'll figure out our vendor relations later. We'll figure out our technology inside of the four walls and routing, binning and batching later. If that was your strategy. You know, the capital markets are going to crush you in the next two, three quarters. You mentioned the margin element there. So us how do the margin, uh, levels vary when comparing you know your most mature markets your philadelphia's your strongest markets in the us to your incredibly new markets say in europe or any that you expand to what is that margin you said high 30s low 40s is it like negative on the margin side in new what does that variance look like just help me understand that so it's margin is not the only element to profitability right you you need a healthy basket size Right. Because if you have, you take dollars to the bank, right? Not percentage points. Right. So, like, as an example, I'll call is our lowest gross margin percentage category, but our highest gross margin dollar category. Because baskets are much higher with, with alcohol baskets than non alcohol baskets. So, you rather lose a few percentage points on, on the gross margin percentage side and gain, you know, 10 or $15 on the, on the basket size. Your overall, you know, the dollars that you bring, to the dollars you bring home are much higher. So across the U.S. today, right, I'm going to exclude Europe, but all the new markets that we expand into generally look very similar, right? They start with a, a slightly slower basket size because there's kind of direct correlation between 10 year and AOV. The longer you stay on the platform, the more you start ordering on, uh, on GoPuff. In Europe, um, I'm going to kind of focus on the U.K. for a second. Basket has grown a lot over the last two quarters, but it's still kind of double digits lower than what we see in the U.S. when we're starting the market. So it's grown fast. Um, I think the number one focus we have in, in the U.K. specifically today is continuing to drive a higher basket. And I'll give all the credit uh, to our teams over there. They've done a really, really great job, right? You know, now we're in the, in the, in the 20s. From a, from a basket size perspective, I think that that business is continually going to grow. And, uh, you know, I think it's possible in the next couple of quarters, we're in the high 20s, low 30s from an AOV perspective. Can I ask, you know, given what we said about kind of the capital availability for the space itself, um, is this a race to profitability now for everyone surviving in the space? I think any company in any space that's not thinking about profitability right now and is not focused on profitability, there's a higher chance they're not that the, these companies will probably not exist in the next year or year and a half, I mean, no matter how strong your balance sheet is. Because you know, no one know, no one has a crystal ball. No one knows how long this is gonna last. No one knows how, how long the capital markets are gonna continue to stay depressed. And the reality is, you know, I can speak for us, uh, you know, we built uh, a new financial model that's completely self-funded, right? One that doesn't require any more outside capital, one that only looks at our, our balance sheet. And by the way, 
It's not one where we said, hey, we're going to cut all costs completely. We're going to stop innovation completely. We could be profitable even faster. But, you know, you want still somewhat of a balance of being able to continue to grow, continue to innovate, right? Like our kitchens business, for example, is crushing. Every week is a record from the week prior, right? We want to continue to invest into that business because it's doing well, but we're not going to invest that how we used to invest, right? We're not going to be opening up, you know, two or three dozen buildings a month, right? That have kitchens. So it's a balance between, um, you know, driving really strong EBITDA and still innovating for the customer. So that balance for us at least meant that we're profitable in 2024, Right. Right. What's, and the core, what's the core differences between the old financial plan and the new financial plan you mentioned? What are the big changes? It's less buildings. Um, so what, what drives, you know, on a unit level, you could be really proud. So if you look at like on a, on, on a metro basis, all of our existing metros are producing, you know, cash flow. So you have your, your we call, call your cash cows, right? In Philadelphia, Chicago's. Uh, Boston's, now Miami's, uh, all of our Texas markets of the world that are are producing cash flow, uh, but you have a lot of new markets that need time to get first to unit economic profitability, then EBITDA profitability. So if you continue to open up markets, you're going to continue to have, you know, an existing business that produces free cash flow, but uh, a new business, right? This emerging business that's still. Uh, requiring investment and causing the overall picture to be negative. Right? I'm talking about the, the overall uh, uh, EBITDA picture. So for us, that meant you know opening up significantly less buildings, so you know less less kind of fixed costs out the door, not focusing on initiatives um, that are you know might be good for tomorrow, but you know not so good for today. Like I'll, I'll give you one that hits kind of close to home. We launched a pharmacy business. Uh, in Philadelphia, we're actually delivering prescription drugs to folks. And I love that business. And it's one that I think we'll come back to one day. But we just said, hey, Matt, you know, it's a great idea, just not for 2022. So it's it's sometimes saying no to these really shiny objects that customers might really love. But it just like, you know, given the, the environment of today, you know, we can't afford to invest eight figures. And this net new business that's going to take, you know, multiple years to pay back, right? Because it takes a while for these businesses to incubate and then, you know, reach a terminal velocity and everything else. So it's it's re- being really, really strict from a prioritization perspective. And then also, you know, controlling your fixed costs, right? So, you know, we're not going to add a, you know, fleet of hundreds of more buildings in the next 18 months, right? We'll strategically open buildings where it makes sense. But we're, we're not going to be opening up buildings like we were opening up buildings in the last 18 months. From a prioritization perspective, I spoke to Emil Michael before the show. Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful conversation I had with him. But he told me about all the different avenues and products that you can build. Uh, and I, I'm fascinated. When you think about that and the question that we just had there, in this new, more capital constrained, newer financial like plan world, how do you fundamentally prioritize between the initiatives you do do versus those that you don't do? A lot of products that you build in the product roadmap uh, are things that are good for you or things that are good for the customer. And sometimes there's an overlap on things that are good for you, you meaning the team or the company uh, and the customer meaning the customer. So sometimes there's an overlap. So being relentlessly focused, uh, I'm talking about like the consumer product team as an example, being relentlessly focused on things that are only going to drive kind of better consumer behavior. So whether it's better discovery or better basket building, I'll tell you like a feature that we're launching, you know, that we, we've talked to a lot of customers and the feedback they get is, you know, place, a, place an order on GoPub and right after I place an order, I'm like, God, I forgot toothpaste or a light bulb or batteries, right? Immediately after I click the place order button. So we'll give people a chance, right? Two minutes post their order to continue to build their basket for anything that they want. Remind people, hey, these are the items that, you most frequently, most people most frequently forget uh, after after placing an order. So a lot of those kind of features where we're really listening to the customers and like I'm talking about now just from consumer product room that perspective uh, that we're really doubling and tripling down on. On the driver side, you know, the first week of October, we're having uh, a global rollout uh, of a new routing software. 
right? So we, we've integrated almost entirely the Ride OS business, right? And that's improved routing, binning, and batching tremendously, right? It's all under uh, the, the GOP of Umbrella now. The first week of October, we have, uh, you know, kind of V2 of that launching, uh, which I think will keep P90 delivery time stable, but will improve our ability to bin and batch by, I think, you know, pretty close to double digits. Yeah. So not only, uh, you know, it, that, that, that's not a really huge effect on the consumer side. Consumers actually won't see a massive difference from, uh, from a delivery time perspective, but it'll save us a good bit of money on, uh, on our CPO side. It's interesting because what worries me is, um, and what I've seen as a consumer, um, I, I will never lie to you, dear Raf, um, I, I have uh, a propensity to switch between different providers. And what I've seen with certain providers is with the cutting of costs, you see two things really happen. Well, three things. One is customer service is the first to go. Live chat goes, and that sucks. Two, you see increased delivery times, like lot, it was 10 minutes, now it's 40, 45, or not at all in some cases. And then three is inventories just depleted to shit and unavailable. So unlike SaaS businesses, where if you cut cost, the core NetSuite product or Salesforce stays the same. You might not have the same cadence of innovation of product, but when you cut cost here in our businesses, you really feel it. And then it creates this negative flywheel effect where in most of those other services, I don't use them anymore because it's so shit across those three dimensions. Do you see what I mean? And does that concern you? Yep. So it absolutely uh, concerns us and uh, probably not in the way that you're, you're thinking about it. Right? So I think, you know, looking back and being a little critical on ourselves, right? Gopa was never built to be a 10 or 15 minute delivery service. And I think because the consumer on a global scale, right? And I'm, I'm talking outside the US, right? We're focused on the UK for a second. In the UK, the consumer was almost taught that 10 or 15 minute delivery is a norm. Yeah. And maybe in somewhat in New York, that was the case too. And that's not a sustainable business model, right? Any stretch of the imagination. The reason why it's not sustainable predominantly is because you can't batch orders, right? What makes, uh, you know, a, a group of orders really, really profitable is if a driver can leave with two, three, four orders at once and still deliver it quickly. So what we learned from on the consumer side, uh, I'm talking about the, the U.S. business, and I think it translates really well uh, on a global scale too, is people don't necessarily want a really fast delivery. They want a really consistent delivery. So they rather really have like, a 30 minute average with, you know, a seven, eight minute deviation than like a 20 minute average with a 15 minute deviation, right? Where, you know, there's an inconsistency in delivery. And that's kind of been our go-to for you know, five, six, seven years. And I think we get a little carried away in the UK uh, with kind of trying to, to match what the... Uh, the, the local uh, players were doing instead of going back to our roots, which is like, hey, this is what consumers generally want is a consistent delivery, delivery over delivery. And two, by the way, that's the profitable business, right? Because you can bin and batch a lot better, right? Your, your tech can predict orders coming in a lot better. And then in turn, you can deliver a really great experience. I think on the, on the CS side, uh, it's a massive mistake to cut CS. Uh, it's one of the areas that we're we're trying not to affect in a in a really big way, right? As you know, we did uh, we did a reorg. Um, I think again, just being uh, very very blunt, it's just folks that are not thinking about you know how to control their cost in a way that doesn't affect consumers or the the players that just won't be here in the next twelve to eighteen months, right? I don't want to repeat myself, but that that's the, the hard reality of what we're living in right now. How does batching actually change the economics? To me, listening from the outside, I go, I, I see it. That makes sense. Maybe a five, ten percent difference, but it doesn't like make a inherently unsustainable business suddenly sustainable. How does batching actually change the economics? Just to help me understand that. So you need a lot less drivers when you batch to fulfill a lot more deliveries, 
So your cost on a per order basis, it's actually not a 10 or 15% swing. You know, in a market that has a high ODH, the amount of orders a driver could fulfill an hour, versus a market that has a weak ODH, the cost difference on the variable cost side could be as high as 50%. Right, so it's a, it's a massive difference of like you know a metro that looks good or a metro that doesn't look good. And generally speaking, in our business, a metro that doesn't look good is a new metro, right? Because it doesn't have enough orders yet on a per day basis where you can effectively batch. Because batching only works well is if enough orders are coming in, or the system can predict enough orders are going to about to come in in the same two or three square block radius of a given city or neighborhood or wherever that MFC is placed. So if you're going to able to, you know, with a high degree of confidence, predict that, hey, an order came in, the next two to three minutes, wait to send that order out. Next two to three minutes, another order is going to come in within that same block. Or, you know, in a really good city, orders are just flying in, right? right? They're doing, you know, five, six, seven, 800 orders a day, right? You don't even have that problem anymore, right? The system is just kind of working in the back end, batching orders together and sending it out. And the key to that, right, the on on the on the on the end side, why why it's a lot cheaper is you just need a lot less driver partners. Right? You you have fewer driver partners doing a lot more deliveries. And by the way, your driver partners love this, right? Because they're making a lot more money. So uh, you know they're getting paid on the per delivery side. So they're making a lot more money. You need less driver partners to fulfill the same amount of orders. Uh, as a byproduct, your CPO starts decreasing tremendously. Well, sorry, what's CPO? Uh, cost per order. All right, cost per order. Uh, can, can yeah, I... sorry. You, you get used to these acronyms internally and then you forget that, you know, it's not part of common vernacular. No, no, listen, this is totally fine. I will just clarify. Uh, in the old days, I'd be like, oh, yeah, CPO. Now I'm like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, tell me, it is ODH, which is the orders per driver per hour? Yeah, yeah, it's the amount of orders your driver fulfills per hour. Is that the governing metric of success in your business, do you think? Or is it AOV? Or is it... What is the governing metric of success in your mind? And I know it's difficult to say, but if you were to pinpoint one... So the first thing is like none of it matters if you're not producing positive unit economics. So a market is not producing, you know, if you're not making, if you're making less, if, if your unit economics are negative, right? It, it really doesn't matter, right? <laughs> on on what, what, what you want to do, what you don't want to, like today our focus is a little different than, you know, maybe the way that you want me to answer that question. Like when you're growing, Right. You want you want to do everything right. You want to increase basket or you want to reduce costs. That's right. the only way to to, to to deliver, you know, positive unit economics. Once a market has achieved right, its target unit economics where there's four dollars positive on a per order basis or we have markets that are doing eight or nine dollars positive on a per order basis. After that, the only thing that matters is volume. Right. Because like you need to produce enough volume then in that city to cover your fixed cost. And so you're not positive on a gross margin basis, you're positive on an EBITDA basis. So the fir first step right, in this business is you know, deliver positive unit economics. Right? And that's through you know, starting with a healthy gross margin. Right? So that means you, know, you have an underlying you know, right-built business. Right? You have good vendor relations. You have the, the right distribution centers. You have the right you know, contracts. There's, there's, there's a whole host of things that, that lead to... You know, building the right assortment and having the right gross margin associated with it, and then uh, two, you know, after you've uh, you've built your your target AOV, because like our AOV has improved, you know, hundreds of percentages since we've launched the business, right? And we had an AOV in the teens, then in the twenties, now in the thirties, right? On, uh, on an average basis, right? As the basket size continue to improve and as we continue to build more technology. To be able to bin and batch better, uh, you know, the next layer of that is just more orders, right? Because now every order that's leaving the door is very profitable. So to get profitable on aggregate basis, right, and, and a totally bit of basis, you just need enough orders. Does that make sense? I totally get you in terms. It, it totally makes sense in terms of the orders. The thing that I think to you straight away is actually Facebook. 
which sounds terribly weird, but I'm going to explain. Um, Facebook obviously had the metric that once you added, I think it was five friends, you were like a retained or an engaged user. Thinking about kind of order frequency and cohorts, how do you determine a retained GoPuff user? Is it three orders in a month, five in a a, a week what is the frequency which shows you that you have a retained user with a behavioral change towards gopuff yep there are actually two ways to look at it right um a customer that orders across three categories in their first order will spend six hundred dollars more than that year than a customer that orders from one or two categories so it's not just how it's not just how frequent they order it's what is the first time, the very first time they get them to go up, what is their shopping behavior? So are they coming into the with the intent of, hey, like, you know, I heard this place has really great ice cream. I'm going to buy a pint of ice cream. That customer on is, is their first year will spend less money than a customer that comes and buys their ice cream and also buys a snack and also buys some some household items and maybe some medicine. Right, three or more categories means significantly more spend that first year. So, what we try to do um, is uh, breed better discovery on the first experience. Right, give a broader, uh, uh, broader kind of category uh, discovery. Right, when we when you launch GoPuff, especially on a new time customer, and also we try to drive behavior to get to two orders in the first fourteen days. That's really, really important. So like what you're seeing is that you have your biggest drop off from order one to order two. Then you have a smaller drop off from order two to order three. And once they get to the third order, they're, they're our customer. And they're not, they're not leaving go. Right? If you look at, you know, order three, get customers that made it over three and you look at the retention cohorts over the next 12 months, we're losing like low double, di- low, low, sorry, low single digit percent of our customers, like two, three percent. So once they get to order three, Right, they're they're ours. the 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 struggle is not just getting them to order three, but getting them to order qu- three quickly. So, like, if you're getting to from order one to order two in, God, in like sixty days, what can you uh, do to drive? Yeah, you. What, what can you, you do to you drive do getting to order instead of instead of doing it an incentive? Right, you know, us like many other e-commerce players used to do an incentive only off one order. Right, all of our incentives now are uh, value over time. Right, we built a gamification into our into our platform where daily you could come in, you could spin the wheel, uh, get uh, free puff points, uh, which can be then used for for prizes. You can win things and spin the wheel like a you know white claw sponsor at a Tesla. So one customer is gonna is gonna get a free Tesla uh, or Live Nation tickets uh, on a global scale to see their favorite artists. So like. We give people a reason to keep coming back, even not to purchase, to just keep coming back in the app and utilize it. We built challenges within the map, so missions. Uh, if you start and you order three times in a row, you get increased amount of uh, of, uh, of points, which then can be redeemed for prizes. And one of the single largest driving factors is we improved FAM tremendously. So we started the year with 11% of our subscribers being FAM customers. So FAM is our subscription program. Uh, two quarters later, 11% has now become 30%. So 30% now of our, of our ordering customers are FAM customers and their behavior, especially if we get them on their first order, is widely different than customers that don't sign up to FAM, right? Whether it's the first, second or third order. So we believe we're just getting started there. We believe the you know, steady state number is you know, north of 55 or 60%. On can, can the, I, sorry, on the can I just dive in and interrupt of course. A couple of things I just want to touch on. Like, I, I use GoPuff a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say how much, um, but uh, uh, I use GoPuff a lot. And I've never seen the points. And I, obviously, I have them. Is that a product mistake of GoPuffs, respectfully, that I didn't know there was a point system and I didn't see the incentives, respectfully? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, we, we don't do as good of a job. Uh, I'm assuming, Harry, you order most of your orders in the UK. Uh, we don't do as good of a job on the product side and the, uh, on the point side uh, from a priority perspective. They've been prioritizing, rightfully so, discovery in new categories rather than loyalty. Um, we're going to have a more th- – there's some things that from a copy and paste standpoint didn't work from the U.S. to Europe. 
Um, so we said, you know, we're going to have a very, very local approach. Uh, assortment building, right? Like <laughs> you got, you, you had to build a very local assortment uh, in market. Uh, and I think we learned that the hard way when we just launched uh, in, uh, in Europe for the first time. But there's some things that work really well on the global scale. And uh, I think we should prioritize loyalty in, uh, in Europe in a bigger way, uh, the same way we do in the U.S. That's going to change over the next, uh, throughout the end of the year. Uh, we're going to make that a lot more evident in our, specifically in our UK markets. Can I push you on the fam side too? And I'm sorry, I don't mean to push you, but like, have you done testing and how much does it cost to be a fam member? I, I am in the UK, but I can't remember how much it costs, uh, which is I've not my it. point, but how much is it? $6 a month. Have you done price elasticity testing on that $6 a month? Because if you we, increase we literally have 10, a test running right now. I wouldn't as, know. I, 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 as we speak, we have a test running right now. Yeah. So it's it's out it's out in the wild because I think on that yeah it's uh, one of those ones where you can unbelievably increase revenues without changing a thing beautifully. Yep. So we actually we haven't seen a big drop on conversion on price. The question is is what the behavior looks like two three four months out. Does that customer continue staying a customer at a higher price point where we think consumer spending is going to get affected? over the next couple of quarters. So, you know, where I believe the world is going to head is that the next two or three quarters, the customer is going to get more price conscious. You know, they're going to have less disposable income and they're going to start making decisions on what are the most important things in their life. And the way that we've structured GoPuff is it like, and FAM specifically, it's like a no brainer to be a part of FAM. It's very, very affordable. You get a lot of value for it as, as a byproduct. But in general, GoPuff is very, very affordable, right? It's in line to what people see in traditional retail from a pricing perspective. And, you know, the last thing that we wanted to do, in a re, you know, is start increasing fees and pricing in a way where, you know, today it doesn't matter, but two or three quarters where consumer spending starts getting affected. They're like, wow, GoPuff is too expensive for me to, to continue to be you know, either subscription customer or, uh, you know, such an active customer. Does it change your inventory? Do you think about, hey, how do we introduce more, uh, you know, we have Poundland in the UK, I guess it would be Dollar General in the US, but mm -hmm. like very much like very dollar centric products, which shine on that, it's a dollar each. Do you think about changing inventory in that way or not? Yeah, I've been studying a lot uh, the past two recessions that have been happening in the U S and you know, what are the industries that grew through recessions? Um, alcohol is particularly resistant to uh, any effects of an economic downturn. I think people, you know, it's funny. We were joking. People, I think drink when they're happy or they drink when they're sad. Uh, I think the, the type of alcohol that's purchased uh, during a recession is different, right? People are not going to be buying your two, $300 price tag item, but they're going to be buying more of your $15, $20 price point item. So I actually don't think baskets are going to change from a, from a dollar amount perspective, but the assortment inside of the basket is going to change, right? More of the kind of budget, uh, budget bottles, uh, but more quantity versus one kind of high ticket, high end item. So we've been leaning into alcohol uh, in a really big way. Convenience also grew. Um, during the last recession, uh, you know, especially a few categories within convenience, vices do very well. So we've been focused on, you know, studying the trends of the two pre uh, previous recessions. The best data we have, I've never lived through a recession. The closest thing I've had uh, to ec economic downturn was on a micro basis, you know, because we didn't raise any money uh, in the beginning. So we had to behave like we were in a recession, uh, you care not, because we had no money. Uh, but we actually never lived as, as CEOs through through a recession. So we've been studying, you know, the last the last two times it happened, you know, how did people behave? And we've been building, uh, continuing to build an assortment that kind of matches those kind of behaviors. Can I ask, before we touch on kind of leadership through more macro challenging times, um, we said we're friendlies and so we can do this, but I'm just, I was interested. Why did you pull out of Spain? I don't think we should ever launch Spain. This is like, Harry, me being very, very honest with you. 
Uh, we got into Spain via the Dija acquisition, and we probably should have pulled out immediately instead of waiting to pull out. I think as a, as a founder, uh, when you're in the midst of a bull market and everything is going great and your core U.S. business is rocking and you know things are just piling on top of each other, good things I'm talking about, piling on top of each other, and everyone is telling you to do more, right? Because you've shown a, a massive track record of a- operational excellence. Um, you kind of get uh, this idea that you can take on more than you should take on. And we've always had a nail it, then scale it mentality. And Spain was a scale it, then nail it strategy, right? We should have, what we really should have done in, in Europe is we should have owned the UK, Right, we're now like I think twenty five percent market share in the UK and instant needs. You know that in the next two months will be in the low to mid thirties. Right, and we're going to continue to grow and kind of dominate, dominate there. We should have become the number one player in the UK, own the UK, then expand it to our next country. Right, you know, that's what we did in the US as we continue to kind of expand throughout states. We used to own a market entirely, own a market, kill everybody in there, and then kind of continue to to expand. And that strategy put it out to be super fruitful because we opened up New York, for example, last. Right? And a lot of people thought that, like, you know, you guys are way too late. There's so many players, right? We own 70% of the instant needs market in New York right now. It's not, it's, not, it's not even close to the number two player, even though we're the last player to come in. Because we really, pardon my fight, we had our shit together in a, in, a, in a very, very deep way. And... That's the way we should have handled Europe, right? In hindsight, right? But no one has a crystal ball, right? No one a year ago could have told you in the midst of a bull market that we'd be going through this kind of economic downturn and maybe it wouldn't have mattered, right? If we continue to stay through a bull market and people continue to value uh, kind of growth over consolidated EBITDA. Uh, but, you know, here we are. Had you known that it was coming, is there anything else you would have done? What else would you have done differently? Like closing Spain straight away would have been one. Is there anything else that you would have done differently? Probably wouldn't have tested as many things as we've tested, right? I I mentioned pharmacy to you as one. It's like, it's not even the money aspect, the distraction factor for the team on like not focusing on the, the things that matter most. Like I mentioned kitchens earlier, we probably opened up too many kitchens too fast. Like right now, we're op- we're ready to open up a lot more kitchens, right? Because the business is so well oiled, and assortment is right. Amelia, who's running that team, uh, she's done a really really phenomenal job at continuing to scale that business. So like, in general, we were moving very very fast because the market was rewarding us for moving fast, right? Because we continue to deliver in a really big way. Kira and I continue to over deliver in the things that we do. We had a really great team around us and the market is like, you know, why is, it, 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 we did everything that like, you know, even our investors, every, we, we'd be doing even more, right? We were saying no so much. They're like, you should, you know, what about Southeast Asia? What about Japan? What about, you know, the rest of Europe? We said no so much of things, but in hindsight, we probably should have said no even more. And just really focused on the things that we're exceptional at. Instead of, you know, continuing to... Lo- innovation is good, but innovation just for the sake of innovation is not good. You know what I mean? Innovate where it's important for the customer and where the customer really wants. And it's a, it's a funny thing, right? You get rewarded as a byproduct. My one question, though, actually, when I look at it is... Is this time, and you know, listen, a recession is always horrible. People lose jobs. It's not a nice thing, obviously. But is this time actually secretly good for you? And what I mean by that, and I say this as your friend, but if I analyze the last two years, bluntly, the competition I don't think served you well. I think, you know, the likes of local players in the UK made you go to the 10 minute delivery when, or try and do the 10 minute delivery when it wasn't optimal. It obviously increased CACs for everyone. Do you actually think that this period will cause a lot of people to not be in business anymore and only the strong survive? I think any business across any industry that's not focused on profitability is cooked. And instant needs is no um, is no exception. So I think, you know, I'll touch on your earlier point, right? It is a, an incredibly sad moment as a founder to 
have to say goodbye to people that you personally hired. That's going to happen kind yeah. of on a macro basis across the board uh, in a lot of companies. Sure. And yeah, for sure. Right. It's like on a, on a human level, it's, it's pretty sad that a lot of folks are going to lose their jobs and, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll rebound in a big way as it relates to instant needs. I think a lot more people are going to find it really hard to stay in business, especially the people that are today, which is you know, a, a good majority that are thinking that this is not so bad, right? You know, we're going to, we're going to come out the other side of this, uh, really strong, or this is going to be over in a quarter or two. And Harry, who knows it very much, in, 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 you know, again, no one has a crystal ball. No one knows uh, you know, what's going to happen in the future. But, you know, my experience, I've seen that paranoid founders are usually the founders that win, right? The ultra paranoid, right? That are prepared for anything, right? The uh, Are usually the ones that win. And, you know, that's how we're tr treating it, where we're, we're ready for anything that uh, uh, the macro throws at us. And we're building uh, towards a business that's completely self-funded. Is this an acquisition opportunity for you with many of these players really looking for exits? We've seen them looking for exits. We're both in the business. We've seen them shopping around and their brokers shopping around. Is this one where you're like, actually, we have a real opportunity to buy something at a good price here that wouldn't be around without us buying them? You know, yes and no. Um, and the reason being is like, it's such a massive distraction to integrate a shitty business. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, some some of these businesses have a decent amount of customers and it just makes sense to, to think about acquiring them for the user base, right? Which is very different than, you know, in our business, the logistical, tech logistical business, um, to acquire a business that, you know, doesn't have really good infrastructure. It doesn't have really good tech. You have to scrap everything. You have to integrate your systems. You go into their buildings. Their buildings are, you know, they're trash, right? They're not big enough or they have the wrong equipment and they're set up all incorrect. Like the, the distraction of, of having to do this, it, the juice is just not worth the squeeze, you know, nine out of 10 times. But at one out of 10, right, where you had a really strong founder, or a group of founders and are very hungry that are really focused on building the right kind of business. You know, it's worth looking at. We saw that in DJ. We saw that in fancy where, you know, not even necessarily the businesses were very big or strong, but the founders were so good and they matched our value so well that it just made sense to integrate. Now today, uh, in today's environment we're we're being very, very picky, right? I'm bringing on businesses that j just, have not set up that same correct infrastructure that we want them to. And two, frankly, like, you know, we don't want to inherit, you know, the losses that this business has. Right? And sometimes those losses are massive, right? A very small business right, from a revenue perspective with very, very large losses. So, you know, it's, it's gotta be right is, is the uh, long and short way of answering that. Two to three years out, what does the, the space look like? You know, I think yeah, I'm obviously biased. <laughs> really? I'm a, no. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I obviously I obviously have a bias, but you know, try, trying to be as as unbiased as I can is the instant needs world is very very complicated, and I think. You know, at least from my standpoint, right, on, on the GOPUB side, uh, you know, we all kind of have a chip on our shoulder, right? A, a lot of people say, you know, this business can't be profitable. You know, two decades ago, Webvan and Cosmo, uh, you know, couldn't make it. So today, two decades later, all these players uh, plus GOPUB who, who started this thing, you know, it's, it's, it remains to be seen whether this could be an even a profitable business. I think that puts a massive chip on our shoulder, on Yukira and I. First of all, because we built a profitable business. We were profitable for three years. And second of all, I have, you know, a near 100% degree of confidence that we're going to do it again in the next 18 months. So we have a massive chip on our shoulder right, on uh, kind of delivering that and proving 
uh, to, to everyone that this is not just a, an amazing consumer business, not just something that consumers really love, but a very profitable business and sustainable business. So I think to answer your question, the folks that are thinking that way, you know, will be here to stay. I, I think on top of all of that, we're going to continue to be the number one global player. Um, but, you know, anyone else that uh, positions themselves to build really strong economics and profitability uh, will have a right to compete in this space. Fine, final one for a quick fire. And it's incredibly fair, so don't worry. Um, if you were to choose one competitor that you most admire, who would it be? You know, I think for us, since day one, when we when we launched Gopa, we have looked, you know, almost in awe at Amazon, obviously. Like, I'm talking about not, not from, from the in, instant need space, but from a global e-commerce perspective. Everything... That, that we saw from Amazon and Bezos, why we hired so many people from Amazon is because we have an immense amount of respect for what they built, right? Uh, specifically in the U.S., getting into any industry they see fit and then uh, for many years dominating in that industry uh, was something that we drew a lot of inspiration from. So I think, you know, not even in our industry, I think it's probably the the most complicated and amazing business in the world. Right? And I think what they built from a logistical perspective and then uh, expanding to new business units, right? Whether it's uh, FBA or AWS uh, is something that we take a lot of inspiration from as we launch our new businesses, right? Whether it's Gopa Ads or some of the new businesses we have brewing that are, that are launching in the next two quarters. So, if you were to place a bet on new business growth for your new business lines, it could be ads, it could be kitchens, it could be any of the others. What in the next two to three years do you think will be the biggest from where it is today? I have one that I can't mention that I think will be the biggest because we haven't launched it yet. and we haven't. Oh, you tease are you. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that business uh, one day can be as large as our retail business, right? as large as, uh, uh, as, large as you know, GoPub as it exists today, right? The GoPub app. Um, I think if we're talking about existing business units that exist today, I think our ads business has done tremendously well and has, uh, and has grown under, um, under the last couple of quarters. Um, personally, uh, the kitchen's business is my favorite business. I order our cauliflower pizza every day. Uh, my wife thinks I'm insane, but, uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy it and I really do think that we built a, an amazing consumer product. And what I love about the kitchens business even more is that on the standalone, the kitchens business doesn't make sense. So we just launched, you know, kind of GoPuff Kitchens as a standalone business without core GoPuff, right? All of our general merchandise, alcohol, everything else is a byproduct. You just don't have enough basket size to deliver a profitable business. But Gobov Kitchens married with the core Gobov assortment together, you know, it's it, it really is something special, right? You're seeing in markets where we have Gobov Kitchens attachment rates of 20%. So 20% of, of consolidated orders adding a kitchens item in there, something that we cook in, inside one of the... So I think that business shows a lot of promise, right? And a lot of growth and something that consumers obviously really love. So... I'm going to continue to place a really massive bet on that business, even though it is capital intensive, right? You have to physically build and open up kitchens. But the ROI on those kitchens is becoming better and better kind of month over month as we're, we're continuing to refine the assortment and the quality. And then two, it's, it's something that's just a net, add, net positive additive to, to the overall business, right? It increases retention. It's very rare that you introduce a category that improves retention, improves frequency, and improves basket. Alcohol was one of those uh, one of those categories. The Gop of Kitchens business is another one of those categories that improves all and moves all three KPIs in the right direction. I, I totally get you. Uh, final, final one. I promise. Has there been what one investment have you disagreed with the board on making? And it doesn't mean there's like a board disagreement, but like you know, board members have. I think we should focus on ads. I think we should focus on kitchens. I think we should focus on. Has there been one where you've disagreed? I don't think 
disagreement probably is the wrong word, but you know, I think midpoint last year, there was a lot of conversations, not just with our board, but investors on how fast we should be moving in Europe. And a lot of folks were really pushing us to expand to Germany faster, uh, expand to other areas in Europe faster. And I'm really glad that we did it. So it wasn't, it wasn't very much a decision. It was more of a conversation than anything else on like, you know, how fast should we be moving in Europe and how many countries can we open up? Because like, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, it's funny, right? You, you do well, right? And you start producing results. You know, people are just like, you know, just keep replicating that, right? You get some pattern recognition, just keep replicating what you've been doing. Uh, but it's not always that simple, right? On just you know, kind of continuing to layer. Again, it, it doesn't match our, our core tenant of nail it and scale it. So I think that's probably been the only one in the last year where, you know, we've had conversations about how fast we should be moving in Europe, how much we're expanding. I mean, obviously today, everyone's looking back and saying, good that we did it <laughs> and good that we're, we're, we stayed focused. Again, in hindsight, probably should have had it a little bit more focus if we knew this was going to happen on a bull market basis. No, I totally get you. Ralph, I could talk to you all day, as you know. Um, really should do this with uh, every question I ask, you have to do a Don Julio 42. And every question I answer, I can oh, do man. one. There we go. This will be a much more open interview. <laughs> Your team are going to be going, oh, no. Oh, no. I think 15 minutes in, we're going to have a hard time talking to one another. Uh, listen, I'm going to do a quick fire round, which means you're screwed if we do a tequila shot. But um, uh, it, it, so I say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. What gets harder and what gets easier with scale? What gets harder, is, you know, is managing people and culture, right? You have to be even more transparent and you have to spend uh, an even bigger time with your team to make sure that everyone has the same vision and understanding what you're going through. It gets easier, right? At least for us, we don't have to live in warehouses anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so I think just living accommodations got easier for for Yukir and I. I think all jokes aside, right? Um, it's a different kind of hard work. Yukir and I still spend a day in the week inside of the MFC every single week. All right, we travel to a new MFC and we visit it. So I think it's a core and important part of who we are. Uh, but. You know, the physical labor gets easier. The mental labor gets a lot harder. Tell me, what do you know now that you wish you'd known at the start of GoPuff? You got to uh, hire taller faster. And taller doesn't mean like a person that comes from a pedigree of a background, but a person that has deep subject matter expertise in a, in a given topic. So, you know, all the advancements that we made on the routing side, for example, we hired subject matter expertise, routing subject matter expertise, you know, seven years ago instead of five years ago or four years ago, we would probably be even more advanced today. So, you know, I think, you know, kind of given the state we were in our first three years of being bootstrapped, we had to be very, very careful on the, the talent we bring on board because of how much it costs. If we hired some of that talent earlier, especially on the engineering and product side, we would have been even further, I mean, like, you know, we're, we're the furthest ahead out of any instant need player by a massive margin. Uh, but that war margin would be even wider if, uh, if we were able to hire even earlier. Uh, penultimate one, who's your closest mentor and what have you learned from them? So Yikira and I uh, have been really, really fortunate. Uh, you know, we're cognizant of the fact that we're 29. And uh, the way that we've gotten to the place where we got into is by surrounding ourselves by the best people. And I don't want to upset anyone because we have a lot of people that were very close, but I'm going to mention someone because you spoke to them, was, which is Emil. Uh, Emil Michael has been a close friend and advisor to Kira and I for five years, six years now. And he's probably the best deal maker in the world. Uh, you know, I think some people would want to argue about that, but you know, I firmly believe that. And he's been nothing besides being an ally and a close advisor and everything. He's been an amazing friend to, to you, Kira and I. So I, have to, I don't want to tell anywhere else, but he's been he's been really, really awesome. I have to thank you after our chat. I said, hey, would you uh, would you like to come on the show? You're, you're very brilliant. And he said, I would love to. Uh, and so uh, I'm pleased that we're going to make that one yeah, happen. Yeah, Thanks to Emil you. Emil is great. I can't um, wait to listen to the episode. 
It'll be good. Uh, final one for you, my friend. Where is GoPuff in five years' time? Very simple. Well, in the U.S., uh, I think uh, we are the undisputed leader in instant needs. Right? We cover a third of the U.S. Hopefully, that number is much higher in uh, in five years. And we've broken into and become in the dominant player in a lot more categories, right? Again, I never thought that I'd be an authority in the baby and pet category. I think I'm going to be saying in five years, you know, a lot more categories than I ever thought that I'd be an authority in. Uh, but we're an authority in uh, the five years from now. I think on a global scale, we're continuing to, to dominate expansion. But I think this time around, we're going to own a market entirely and then open up other markets that we're going to own entirely before expanding to new markets so i don't know how many markets that includes but uh you know we're excited to see excited to see this thing unfold raf i could chat to you all day next time third time lucky it comes the tequila but thank you so much and this has been fantastic harry you're the best man